You know that burn in your legs when you push hard during a workout? For most of your life, you've probably had a simple story about what causes that feeling. Lactic acid or lactate. The stuff that builds up when you're really pushing those last few reps, that final stretch of cardio and your muscles are screaming, we've got nothing left. And here's the thing, that story isn't wrong, but it's incomplete in a way I didn't fully understand until I started digging into some new research. Because it turns out there's another kind of lactate, a mirror image version. And this one doesn't come from your muscles at all. It comes from your gut. And instead of being a marker of effort and hard work, this version seems to be quietly tied to metabolic problems, higher blood sugar, worsening insulin resistance, and fat building up in the liver. I want to be clear about something up front. This isn't one of those stories where I'm going to tell you that lactate is bad or that you need to fear it. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is something more interesting. We're learning that the way a molecule is shaped, almost like whether it's left-handed or right-handed, can completely change what it does in your body. And in 2025, a group of scientists came across something that made them stop and say, okay, this is odd. They found they might be able to trap this mirror image lactate in the gut before it ever reaches the bloodstream. You see, in mice, what happened next was very hard to ignore. Blood sugar came down, insulin worked better, the liver showed fewer signs of stress. So let's talk about what's actually going on here because the biology is genuinely fascinating. And if this ever works the same way in humans, it could change how we think about the connection between gut bacteria and metabolic health. The first thing you need to know is that not all lactate is the same. The lactate your muscle makes during exercise, the one tied to that burning sensation, is called L-lactate. The L just refers to its shape, its handedness. Some molecules can exist in two forms that are mirror images of each other. Think of it like your hands. They're made of the same parts, same bones, same joints, but your left hand and your right hand aren't interchangeable. You can't put a left glove on your right hand and have it fit properly. That difference in shape matters. L-lactate and D-lactate are like that, made of the exact same stuff, just shaped opposite ways. And in the body, that difference is everything. L-lactate is deeply woven into how your body works. It's not just waste. It's what moves between different parts of your body as fuel. Your liver turns it back into glucose. Your heart and your brain use it for energy. We've even learned recently that L-lactate acts like a messenger. It can nudge your immune system and influence how certain genes behave. It does real useful things. D-lactate, on the other hand, doesn't fit neatly into those jobs. Humans barely make any of it on their own. Our enzymes, the tiny machines inside cells that do the work, are shaped to handle L-lactate, not this flipped version. So when D-lactate shows up in your bloodstream, it's almost always coming from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is your gut bacteria. Certain bacteria, especially some types of lactobacillus, make D-lactate when they break down food in your intestines. In a healthy gut with a strong lining, most of the D-lactate stays where it belongs and eventually gets cleared out. But when the gut lining becomes more fragile or when certain bacteria grow more than they should, D-lactate can slip through into the bloodstream. And that's where things start to get interesting. The scientists started with a simple question. Do people with obesity have different levels of D-lactate compared to people without obesity? So they checked blood samples for both L-lactate and D-lactate. One thing stood out right away. D-lactate levels were much higher in people with obesity. L-lactate levels were pretty much the same in both groups. That doesn't prove anything on its own, but it's enough to make you pause and ask, okay, what's this doing? Just seeing higher levels doesn't mean it's causing problems, so they moved to mice. They gave one group L-lactate, another group D-lactate, same amount, same setup. Then they watched what happened. The mice that got D-lactate ended up with higher blood sugar, more fat in their liver, and more stored energy overall. It wasn't subtle. This version of lactate wasn't just showing up, it was clearly making things worse. That raised another question. Where does it actually go once it's in the body? What's happening to it next? To figure that out, they followed the molecule step by step, basically tracking where it traveled 
after it entered the bloodstream. What showed up next surprised me. The liver pulled it in. And instead of safely getting rid of it, the liver uses it like spare parts, turn it into new sugar and new fat. So the liver is literally taking something made by gut bacteria and using it to build more of the exact things that worsen blood control and fatty liver. That's not a coincidence. That's a real repeatable pathway. But they still needed to be sure the gut was really the source of the problem. So they looked at mice raised without any gut bacteria at all. Those mice had almost no delactate in their blood. Then bacteria were introduced and delactate showed up. Here's the part that really surprised me. They didn't just add bacteria. They were very specific. One group got lactobacillus intestinalis, which makes a lot of delactate. Another group got lactobacillus rotary, which makes much less. Same conditions, different bacteria. The mice with the high producing bacteria had worse blood sugar control. The low producing group didn't. That's where the picture really came together. This isn't about good gut health versus bad gut health in some fuzzy feel good way. It's about specific bacteria making specific things that push your metabolism into specific directions. The details matter. At this point, the story is pretty clear. Certain gut bacteria make delactate. That delactate can slip into the bloodstream when the gut lining isn't doing its job as well as it should. Once it's in the blood, the liver grabs it and then turns it into sugar and fat. And over time, that contributes to metabolic problems. So the next obvious question is, can you stop it? Instead of trying to wipe out bacteria or overhaul the diet, they try to take a different approach. They built a trap, a compound that grabs onto delactate in the gut and keeps it from ever getting absorbed. Importantly, it leaves the exercise-related version alone. They mixed this trap into the food of obese mice and watched what happened. Within hours, fasting blood sugar dropped. Over time, insulin worked better. Liver fat went down. Signs of liver stress and damage also improved. And here's what really stood out to me. The mice didn't lose weight. They didn't eat less. Nothing else changed. They just removed delactate from the pitcher. And that alone made a difference. Sit with that just for a second. By blocking a single molecule in the gut before it ever reached the liver, they improved blood sugar control and reduced fatty liver in obese mice. That's surprisingly simple. And it strongly suggests that D-lactate isn't just tagging along when the metabolism goes wrong. It looks like it's part of the problem itself. Now, what does this actually mean for us, for humans? We need to be honest about the limits. This was done in mice. The amount of trap used was pretty high. There are no human trials yet. There's no version of this trap that you can go buy, unfortunately. And we don't have long-term safety data. All of that matters. But the idea behind it is still important. If a gut-made molecule can quietly worsen blood sugar and liver health, and blocking it improves things without changing calories or weight, that opens up a very different way of thinking about metabolism. We already know that the gut lining health does matter. When the gut becomes more leaky, it's a bacteria and their byproducts can slip into the bloodstream and they can trigger inflammation throughout the body. The lactate might be another piece of that puzzle. We also know that what we eat shapes which bacteria thrive. Fiber matters. Probiotics can add new strands, though whether they stick around varies. What we don't know yet is how much control we really have over delactate specifically, or whether lowering it would help people the same way it helped the mice. Some probiotic strands like Lactobacillus reteri make less delactate than others. And that's interesting, but it's just a starting point. We don't yet have human studies showing that choosing low delactate probiotics improves blood sugar or insulin levels. And we don't know which foods or habits reliably shift this in people. Right now, that's still an open question. There's a bigger takeaway here that I find really interesting. For a long time, lactate was treated like waste, something bad, something your body wanted to get rid of. That story has completely changed. We know now L-lactate is actually fuel for the muscles and energy for your workouts. It's a signal. It's something your body actively uses. D-lactate pushes that idea even further. 
not all lactate is the same. Shape matters, the same molecule, except slightly, can behave very differently. Zooming out, this shows how much we're still learning about the compounds gut bacteria makes. Hundreds of small molecules are produced in your gut every day. Some help you, some don't do much. And some, like D-lactate, seem to cause problems under certain conditions. We're only just beginning to map all this out. So what do we actually do with this information right now? Honestly, nothing specific to D-lactate. The trap doesn't exist for people yet. There's no easy test for it, and there are no human trials yet. But there are still reasonable things that line up with what we already know about metabolic health. Supporting the gut lining matters. Eating fiber matters. Managing stress matters. Being mindful about overusing medications that can cause damage to the gut matters. Thinking carefully about probiotic strands might matter, but the science there is still early. If you're already using lactobacillus-based probiotics, I would just look at which types are in there. But we don't have proof yet that this changes blood sugar in people yet. For what it's worth, I'm not doing anything specific to target lactobacillus. I focus on overall gut health and diversity. I eat fiber. I'm not taking a D-lactate trap because it doesn't exist yet in a proven safe form for humans. If that changes in the future, I'll definitely revisit it. What stays with me about this work isn't just the molecule itself. It's how the whole thing came together. Someone noticed something odd. They checked whether it mattered. They followed where it went and they figured out a way to block it without hype, without shortcuts. That's how progress actually happens. So the next time you feel that burn during a workout, remember lactate isn't the villain we once thought, but not all lactate tells the same story. And we're only just beginning to learn much more about what matters and why. If you want to dig into the original research, like always, I link the studies down below. And if you've got thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear about them. This is Dave. Thanks for watching. Stay curious. I'll see you guys in the next one.